the options it gives. Yeah, I assume it's recording on the. Um, I don't know where where it's going to put the recording is also going to be a bit of a mystery, John. But I assume that's going to be trackable because when I record on my Zoom call, it mm -hmm. asked me whether I want to record in the cloud or on my computer. It didn't give me that option. I think by default with the permission there, it should be a local recording. On one of the lit computers then? Uh, on, on your computer. I see. Okay. Um, I'll only be able to tell after I end the Zoom call. That's when it tells me where it, the recording is ending up. If it shows up on my uh, local computer, I should be able to retrieve it and put it on. But thank you very much. For no worries. Um, otherwise, questions. if you think it ended up remote, um, let me know and I'll dig around on, uh, no on our side with Zoom. But as I said, I think it should be local to you. On my computer. Okay, thank you. Excellent. No worries. One of the okay, things we're seeing on the screen. The split and begin. Yeah. Do you see? Okay, thank you. In that previous display, when you were looking at the star, mm -hmm. if you look closely, you would see that you're actually seeing a star reflected on a metal plate, shiny metal plate that has a slit going through it. So some of the starlight mm -hmm. is going into that slit. Uh, and Stefan just widened the slit so we get more of the mm -hmm. image of the star. You, you narrow it <clears throat> and you make the star look like a perfectly symmetric hamburger. <laughs> Just to make sure it's pointed, centered on the slit, and now you you can see the slit more clearly now. You see. Yeah. So part of the light that's going into the slit, if you take that and you imagine, if you take this slit image, um, and you rotate it ninety degrees, so the slit is running vertically, mm -hmm. and the star is occupying the center of the slit. If you make repeated copies of that at different wavelengths you get the spectrum that you saw earlier on the blue half of the spectrum. I don't know, Stefan, if you can switch to the blue spectrum, um, that's what you would get, right? If you took that, took a vertical slit with a star in it and made multiple copies side by side by side, you'd, the star would become this long horizontal streak like this. Mm. And in the case of the red spectrum, you don't rotate the slit. It's just, I mean, the rotation of the slit is just how it's presented on the screen. Now, in the case of the red side spectrum, it's just taking a horizontal slit to the star and making multiple copies of it. So this time we're going to take a red side spectrum, right? Mm -hmm. so we are taking a red side spectrum. So let's yeah. switch to that. Yeah, there you can see the star. Yeah. Uh, it's not centered on the slit. It's near one edge unless the display is not centered. Perhaps the display is not centered here. Yeah, there we go. Okay, it is pretty much centered in the slit. One of the students who works uh, on this team and is an integral member of the team is Stephanie Figueroa. She's mm -hmm. an undergraduate. She's a senior at UC Santa Cruz. So a couple of years junior to Rafael. She is often responsible for running parts of the experiment, but she's at her sister's wedding this um, mm -hmm. tonight. And uh, Monica, who's sort of our <clears throat> thought leader, she's the real, she's the world expert on this, the kind of science we're doing here. She's originally from Manipur. Mm -hmm. um, she got her PhD in Germany. She, she works at the national facility in Hilo in Hawaii. Um, mm. And she and I have been collaborating for like four and a half years. She's one of my closest collaborators. She's the real lead uh, on this. Mm. Uh, she's the most knowledgeable so, of the team. So I was looking at the website, I think for personally visiting Mount Hamilton, looks like there are a couple of smaller telescopes, like yes. the old style, you can go through and look through the you mm. know, eyepiece like the old, old experience of directly looking into the stars and universe, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so, so this one is more the automated one, the bigger. Yeah, this is a bigger telescope. The telescope yeah. diameter is three meters. So the telescope that you can look through, that one has a diameter of um, about 40 inches. So it's, uh, it's actually a 36 inch okay. refractor. Right. We are reading out on red, ready. I'm gonna send the next coordinates to Poco. This thing called POCO is the pointing computer. So, computer is this that a controls target the that is visible. 
yes, my question. Should be, um, if you've got the coordinates there. Um, so the way you would check this is if you look at the, are you at the correct coordinates right now? RA and deck? The mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you look at the POCO C, I think if you look at the, um, a good way to see is just look at the air mass. If the air mass is close to one, that's good. If the air mass is anything greater than two, that's not good. And the hour angle, H A, is how far this thing is off from its highest point. So it's only an hour and a half, definitely visible. So plus, as long as the hour angle is between plus minus four, and three and a half, it should be easily visible. Hmm. Basically, the hour angle is a difference between the RA and deck of the object, and the, uh, sorry, the RA of the object and local sidereal time. So, Moet, are you glad you didn't do this because you would have never passed? <laughs> what, is the, what is the um password? What is the command to calculate the PA again? Ideal. I thought it, it was it's called. Oh, it's called PA. 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 I'm typing in the right thing. Is it IDL or the X term? <laughs> I think uh, it's, it's an X term. It's not an oh, okay. I could be so backwards. There you go. So all these fancy pictures that we see coming out of Hubble and the new, you know, so a lot of the data has to be sort of massaged processed. and processed. Yeah, you have to process it. You have to remove the instrumental signature Sometimes for these telescopes, you have to remove the effects of the Earth's atmosphere. For a space-based telescope, you don't have to worry about the Earth's atmosphere, but there's still reflected light from dust in the solar system, something called zodiacal light, you have to correct for that. So um, we're looking at HA of about 150, if I'm doing this right? One, one um, it should be one, 129. Oh, it's right there, that's right. Yeah, or 129. It, they want two two digits though. Oh, you see. Um, so just yeah, control yeah. C out of it. Just yeah. Twenty five. We are taking, I believe it's like 3,000 seconds. Yeah, 3,000 seconds. 50 minutes? Yeah. Okay. And the reason it needs that is it knows what the parallactic angle is now. It needs to know what it's going to be at the end of the exposure and chooses a mean value. Okay. We have PA of 116.8. Okay, I'm free to move. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I read that wrong. 134, wrong one. 134? 134. Okay. 134. And through some quirk of nature, 134 plus 180 is an anagram of 134, 314. Now, what they're doing now is when you look at a star through the Earth's atmosphere, unless the star is directly overhead, the Earth's atmosphere acts as a little prism and bends blue and red light by different amounts. So it creates a mini spectrum of the star. If you put the slit across that spectrum, you're either capturing blue light or red light, not all of it. So you want to align the slit along the direction in which the Earth's atmosphere is creating this little spectrum. So you want to, if you want to capture all of the light of the star, you want to align the slit. That angle is called the parallactic angle. Uh, and that's what that's what he's you know, that's what so just like on, just like in the landmass, you have a GPS coordinate, right? So if you know the GPS coordinate, you can reach there. Yeah. So who's ever discovers a star in Europe, Asia, your US, they assign, I guess, an address to it. So, yeah, that's right. You you write down coordinates for it. So this thing that you see called RA and DEC yeah. in this window, RA is like a longitude, DEC is like a latitude. Got it. And then it would also change based on where you are telescope is, right? No. So Let me narrow the slit. This is a fairly uh, faint target. I think it's 
I'll come back to your question in a minute. Sure. Did you say 17.2? Uh, 19, sorry. 19.2, so, yeah. wow. And this is, a is this a transient or a variable star? Uh, transient. transient. Wow. I believe this is a transient from the yeah. last few months. Okay. Yeah. That's super. We never, got around to, we never got around to doing it, yeah. Yeah, if we don't see anything, we can, it's possible it's no longer there and we can move on to another. To another object, okay. Which screen are you looking at? The guider, I assume, right? Oh, yes, sorry, sorry. That's okay. Keep go back and forth. That's okay, that's okay, no worries. So you have you looked at this specific star before? We have, but the kind of object we're looking at is something called a transient in that it was very bright, suddenly, appeared, it's very bright and it's been fading since. And mm -hmm. we observed it before, but by now it may have faded enough that we can't see it. And why does that happen? Often these are mini explosions. Oh, okay. So it's the death of a star, not a... It may not be a bird. death, it may not be a death. It's uh, often the most of the transients we see are things mm -hmm. called novae, where, where two stars are in a sort of a binary orbit around each other hmm. and material from one star gets dumped onto the second star there's hmm. sort of detonation on the surface not hmm. violent enough to destroy the star hmm. but enough to make it brighten and fade i see you can see it's this is sort of the this is brightness as a function of time uh, okay. for this object okay i'm guiding you can open the slit and begin so you did find Thank the object you. after all, was this a different uh, yeah, transient? It, yeah. And this looks like a supernova, not a nova. It's one of these optical rebrightening of the supernova, right? Are you doing three right. times 1,000? Yeah, we're gonna go 3,000. All right, starting exposure on red. And starting exposure on blue. I don't so we'll see the number of exposures. Where is that set? Uh, we just set it for one right now, and then oh, then you do. Assuming you we want. find the, assuming we find a spec, uh, gotcha. spectrum, gotcha, gotcha, find gotcha. a trace. But I'll it, do the other two. It's visible on in the guider camera. It seems. Yeah. Um, Definitely visible in the guider camera. Well, it was before the slit was widened. Oh yeah, sorry, I did not. I was not looking. Sorry, <laughs> looking at That's the right. light curve. So this thing that has the crosshairs in the upper right, um, mm. uh, Jeff is using that to, to keep the telescope pointed rock solid at a particular point in the sky. Now coming to your question, Samir, what happens is, say someone discovers a new city on earth, you can mark its coordinates or someone discovers a new lake or mountain, you can mark its coordinates on earth. Everyone agrees on what its latitude and longitude are irrespective of where you live on earth. It's exactly the same for celestial coordinates. You find a star or galaxy, you mark its coordinates. It doesn't matter where you are on Earth. Everyone can reference the same coordinates. So it's just that depending it. upon where the telescope is, you'll point it in different directions. Exactly. You, okay. How the telescope is oriented relative to the local vertical will depend on. It okay. also depends on time of the night, time of year, all of those things, because the Earth is moving around the sun. Cool. And you have to you do a reference with the north star because of the precision of the equinoxes. Is that your cardinal point based on which you kind of do a stellar cartography? Yeah, you do. And the position of the you know the axis of the Earth is now pointed towards Polaris, mm. but it's not always been pointed towards Polaris because the Earth's axis is doing a slow wobble. Yeah, and that's why in every coordinate system you see the mm. chord. These RA and DEC are referencing the year 2000.0. In other words, it's referring to a coordinate system As that corresponds to that north. Got it, yeah. And 22 years later, that has changed. Yeah. Um, so that's why the equinox is important because we live on a planet whose axis is, um, is actually wobbling on a 26,000 year time scale. It's sweeping out a large cone. Mm -hmm. 
26,000 years, isn't it? Is the one? Years, yeah. yeah. It sweeps out a cone in 26,000 years. It's like if you have a spinning top mm -hmm. and you give it a little bit of a wobble, the axis mm -hmm. of the top can do this sort of sweep out a cone while the, while the top is spinning rapidly. Mm. Mm. So, you know, the Earth's axis is rotated 23 and a half degrees from vertical. Mm -hmm. um, that's the angle at which it sweeps out a cone. Yeah. It actually even does something called, that, that motion is called precession, like the mm -hmm. word procession, but with a PRE <laughs> instead of PRO. And then on top of that, uh, if you, so if you, in other words, if you think about the shape that's being mapped out, Mm. It's like a shape of an ice cream cone, right? Mm. That is being mapped out. Mm. But uh, it's actually a corrugated cone because it's also wobbling. The mm. angle is not always exactly 23 and a half. It's oh, really? that, and that motion is called nutation, NU. Not mutation with an M, but nutation with an N. Mm. So the Earth's axis undergoes nutation on a relatively um, short time scale, much mm. longer than a year, mm. but much shorter than 26,000 years. I forget the exact nutation period but the precession period is 26,000 years. Mm. One of the cool things about this is 26,000 years, it seems like a long time, but there's astronomical records that go back 4,000 years. Yeah, yeah. And what is really cool, I remember seeing this, uh, my, um, one of my friends is, uh, is Korean, astronomy colleagues is Korean, is based in Seoul, and he has a strong interest in the history of Korean astronomy, mm -hmm. and there are stone rubbings on ancient observatories, the stone rubbings, you know, what, what would people carve on the side of the observatory? Mm. What they saw in the sky, mm -hmm. pattern of stars in the sky. So the first thing you can see is the shape of the Big Dipper mm. is different. Yes. Yeah. Because 3,000 years ago, those stars are not physically connected to each other. They're moving at different speeds. So right. the shape was slightly different back then. You can, and from mm. that, you can actually tell how old the stone rubbing is. Mm. Second mm -hmm. thing is when you draw star charts today, you'll see circles drawn centered on the pole star. In mm -hmm. that map, people had drawn circles, but they were centered on a different point. Because the, because that the Earth's axis was pointed else. somewhere else. Yeah. And from these things, you can, this is a beautiful intersection of cosmic history with human history. You can, mm -hmm. can actually, can actually tell So can I ask a very uh, basic question, guys? Uh, it's bothered me for a long time. So when you see that, you know, you say that this was the light has come to us, say, uh, 10 billion uh, light years ago, right? But uh, so you can say that this is, um, um, it's taken that much time to get to us, right? But mm -hmm. if you look at the expansion of the universe 10 billion light years ago, we must have been so much closer to that object from where the light is emanating, right? Because so how is that? How does that correlate? How is it? That it's if it's moved ten billion light years, but at that time we might have been two billion light years away from the yeah. object. Yeah. So the thing is, um, what's an easy way to think about this? Okay. Best to think about the universe as the expansion of space itself. Mm. So during the time that light from a distant object, let's say the light from Andromeda, has come mm. to us and not two and a half billion, but two and a half million years. Hmm. Now, during that time, the universe has hardly expanded, right? Because hmm. it's a short, it's a blink of an eye compared to the Cosmic 14 difference. billion years that the universe is expanding. So let's consider a galaxy that's 10 billion light years away. Yeah. Okay. So light has taken 10 billion years to reach us. Right? Hmm. Okay. Now, during those 10 billion years, space itself has expanded. Mm -hmm. So while light has been traveling, you can think of light as a wave and photons and, and you know, this wavelength of the photon and the color of the light. During, the, during its travel time, space itself has expanded. So that stretches out the wavelengths by a certain factor. The longer it's been traveling, the more stretching there's been. And this is how one figures out of how long the light has been traveling because it's the factor by, you get to directly see the factor by which the universe has expanded between light being leaving its source and reaching us. Mm. Not sure if I understand so, fully. So in other words, it doesn't matter that it was much closer 10 billion years ago. 
Mm. In the course of its travel, space has been expanding. Right. Right. So it has no choice but to have traveled for 10 billion years. It, it has traveled for that time. And, and there's been a there dramatic expansion of space during its during its journey that it still has to traverse. Mm. Mm. It doesn't matter that it started out close. Because even though it was close, that space now is vast. But is it true that um, there is some thinking that uh, universe could be expanding faster than the speed of light? It did expand faster than the speed of light in its very early phases during a very rapid period called inflation. But that happened, we can't see that far back in time. We cannot mm. see anywhere close to it. So inflation happened, get this, inflation happened within the first second the universe's mm. history. Mm. In fact, it happened within a tiny fraction of the first second of the universe's experience. Planck or something we call it, right? Yeah, but not quite Planck time. I'll give you the times. The start of inflation was when the universe was 10 to the negative 35 seconds old. <laughs> okay. 10 to the negative 35 seconds old, right? So mm -hmm. 0 mm -hmm. 0.34 zeros mm -hmm. and a 1. That was the age of the universe when this rapid period of expansion started. It ended when the universe was 10 to the minus 24 seconds old. Wow. So you're talking about a very, very early history. How far back can we look? We can look up to a point when the universe was uh, transparent. I mean, universe went from opaque to transparent at some point. It was opaque yeah. early on. Uh, I can describe, I can explain why. It was completely opaque. Light could not travel freely through the universe. Just like light cannot travel through a star because it's dense and it's got electrons that it bounces off. The universe was full of plasma. It was very dense. Mm. in its early history so that light could not travel freely. Mm. So there could be no astronomy at that time. Right? There, could be, there, were no, there was no living things at that time. But anyway, mm -hmm. the universe was opaque until it was 380,000 years old. Mm. 380,000 years old. And inflation mm. happened within the, well within the first second. But isn't it um, accelerating at, uh, expanding at an accelerating rate? Or is it that is, just a myth? But the rate at which it's expanding is much slower than the speed of light. Now, it is. Current, okay. current expansion rate is much so slower. So the expansion rate. slowed down and it's expanding again. Yeah. So it'll, if you think about um, the expansion, it was very, very rapid for a short yeah. period. Yeah. Then, yeah. Since then it's, uh, it, it, it's it, dramatic again. Mm -hmm. it, it completely slowed. Uh, it was still expanding, but at a very slow rate. And that's been sp gradually speeding up over time. Mm -hmm. So you said astronomy wasn't possible in the first 300,000 years. It will also not be possible several million, not million, billion. It'll become boring. Be it'll become boring in billions of years because there'll be nothing to study. Nothing to see, right? The, all the, nothing they'll to be see. too far away. You won't they'll see Too far anything. away, exactly. You can think of us living in a golden age, but this golden age is <laughs> billions of years in length. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but again, in cosmic yeah. timeline... Exactly. Compared to a human lifetime, it's so long that it almost doesn't make sense to call it a golden age. There could be many, so there probably are and uh, have been many, many sub human civilization length yeah. um, species that have yeah. enjoyed this. So yeah. a more philosophical question, what do we really define as universe? Like what constitutes universe? Um, so uh, astronomers use a term called observable universe. Okay. And that, that is less abstract than the term universe. An observable universe is a part of the universe we can study today. And that is actually because it's connected to us, the observer. It's a sphere centered around us whose radius is equal to the age of the universe multiplied by the speed of light. It's a very well-defined thing. Anything that has had time to send us light during the universe's existence is part of our observable universe. Not the entire universe, the part of the universe we can observe today. So I find that to be a very useful operational definition of yeah. the universe. It has an adjective in front, but it makes it much more tangible. Um, 
No, as, as you guys said, there's been so much written and there's some wonderful talks. Brian Green, Carl Sagan, Neil. Neil gives you know, amazing talks. Um, if I'd be, I have created a cure for insomnia myself. If you're having trouble falling asleep, I can send you a video link of a talk on galaxies. I'll put this in the chat. It's the perfect cure for insomnia, I'm told. I'll send it to you. But also we can look busy at work. <laughs> you know, Brian Cox does some good work as well. He's based in the UK, yes. Yes, yeah. I think his... Uh, it's called the, something the universe. He's done a, some his TV serial. So this particular talk I'm sending you is called the darkest secrets of the universe, and it's something I gave about a year and a half ago at an online forum at the actually at the institute that runs the Hubble Space Telescope. Mm -hmm. They do an online, they do an in-person lecture series, but because of the pandemic, they were doing this online. But I, I'll I'll put this in the chat. Mm -hmm. It's on YouTube. And... Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Welcome to the Space Telescope Public Lecture. That's your, your talk then, Raja. You know, someone introduces it first. And, okay. and for the first 12 minutes, 15 seconds, they're sort of he introduces the series, gives some astronomy news, and then I get introduced at the 12, 12, 15 mark. Thank you. Sure. And the guy who introduces it is someone I've known for a long time, Frank Summers. So we are good friends. And he asked me to do this. I, I agreed to do this. It was a lot of fun. I was actually, you know, when the pandemic hit, mm -hmm. I was uh, on sabbatical in Baltimore at this institute. Mm -hmm. And I had great, you know, I thought, great fun. I'm going to do this in person. But uh, it got cancelled. And yeah, no, by the time I got to do this, it was uh, like we had to do everything I online. Saw darkest secret of so what's going on right now there's an exposure going on uh, yeah, is a thousand that... second exposure so a little over 15 minutes so we're going to take a is that uh, one photograph you'll get one photograph one spectrum one spectrum, spectrum. Like yeah. then we if and, we see that will tell you the composition the whole thing of the star Trying Are to you... understand the nature of this, um, uh, 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 Raphael and Stefan, is this a supernova that we're seeing? Because just the light curve makes it look like that. Right? I'll classified? be honest, I'm not super sure. I don't think this is actually a trend, like a yeah. supernova. I think this is a, a variable star of some sort. It's not a transient? Yeah, yeah if we're looking at this, this one. Okay, okay. So what you're seeing in two mm -hmm. different filters and green light and red light, um, mm -hmm. is a map of brightness versus time. And there's mm -hmm. time in days on the x-axis, mm -hmm. where it says MJD, the D stands for day, modified Julian date. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a date. So we see, so every tick mark on the x-axis is 100 days, you can see, uh, 558,600, 58,000. It's measured relative to some date. Um, and so this thing has been going up and down in brightness. It's sort of plateaued off now. Mm -hmm. Uh, today's date must be near the right edge of this graph. Mm -hmm. um, but you can see that over a period of, what is it, 58,600 to 59,900, so 1,300 days, so over a period of four years, this thing has been bouncing up and down in brightness. So this data for across four years, is it crowdsourced or is it from the same telescope? It's from across? a particular telescope called the Zwicky Transient Factory that's owned by Caltech. These things are so faint that, you know, most, Amateur astronomers, telescopes are too not powerful enough. You know, uh, just to give you a sense of scale, um, this is on a magnitude system. Okay, a magnitude system meaning uh, astronomers use an inverted logarithmic scale. So when something is 20th magnitude, it's, um, um, let, me, let me explain, uh, zeroth magnitude is the brightest stars in the sky. 
not planets, but brightest stars in the sky are zero magnitude. Fifth magnitude stars are barely visible to the human eye. From a completely dark side, they're barely visible. And they're a hundred times bright, fainter than the brightest stars in the sky. So every five magnitudes is a factor of 100. So when you have something that's 20th magnitude, that's three units of five fainter than the faintest stars we can see. So that means it's a million times fainter than the faintest stars we can see. No, so you need you say the next two exposures. It's, sorry, Go is on. that the end of the exposure? Oh, sorry. Uh, next two exposures. Yeah, you want to, if you want to see the spectrum, I've pulled that up. Yeah, if you can move the if you can move the window up, the plot window up just a little bit. Yeah, there's the two D spectrum. So this is the blue part of the spectrum, right? Uh, is there more in the red? Uh, yeah, hold on. Here we go. And a lot more uh, of the lines there. Yeah, let's let's move the plot out of the way a little bit, please. I just want to see the two D spectrum. Yeah, so there's an emission line. That's H alpha right there. Uh, do you see the emission line in the spectrum? Um, let me move. I, I show you with my. Uh, can you guys see my cursor? No. Um, no. So, Yon, Stephen, you, if you move, which one am I pointing at? <laughs> if you look at, if you take your cursor and and point to about the middle of the blue screen. Yeah, there's a little higher up. There's H alpha and nitrogen two right there. Uh, no, lower down. That that bump on the on the on the vertical line. You see that big uh, lower down. A little lower, that bump. That's H alpha, and that's nitrogen two just below it. Uh, if you zoom in, uh, if you just go into the uh, the two D thing and zoom in, you'll be able to see it. Yeah, there you go. You can see both nitrogen two lines. There's a so zoom in some more. Do you see that um, that's that's hydrogen alpha? If you move your cursor down a little bit. Uh, oh no, sorry. Uh, okay, there you go. <laughs> so uh, the main bump that you see there. Uh, so these long horizontal streaks are, of course, produced by the Earth's atmosphere. But the that blob that you're seeing there, that's produced by electrons transitioning from level three to level two in a hydrogen atom. Uh, so I, I'm pretty sure you're, what you're seeing there is H alpha. And then you see a little bump that's lower down from that. Um, so let's see, how can we do this? Can, can I request um, screen control from you? Let me, let me see if I can do this. I have no idea. <laughs> I, I might be able to do this. Let me, let me see if- Oh yeah, uh, remote control. Give, give me remote control, please, for a moment. Okay, so I'm gonna zoom in. going to center. How do I center? Let me try going factor of four. There we go. Okay, so this is H alpha right there. Can you can you guys see my cursor? I, I can see. Okay, that's that's H alpha. This is nitrogen two down here. And this is the other nitrogen two line. Oh, so, sorry. <laughs> so this has a way the, the upper nitrogen two line has a wavelength of 6548. Angstroms. This is six five six three for hydrogen alpha, and this is six five eight four. These are very common nebula lines. I believe this is some kind of uh, interstellar medium. Uh, uh, this is this thing looks like a, an optically rebrightened supernova to me. It doesn't look like a variable star. You know, Monica wrote this recent paper that we're on on optically rebrightening, uh, optical rebrightening of supernovae. I believe this is just stuff from the supernova shock shock wave picking, uh, you know, blasting into the uh, or shock the shock front from the supernova uh, going through the interstellar medium. I believe this is H alpha and N two. Now there should be some sulfur two lines down here, but they may be lost in the mess of night sky lines. Now uh, I could have this identification completely wrong, entirely possible. But um, I'm also thinking, if we zoom out, let's just look at the full spectrum. If we zoom out here. I don't think this H alpha line is at 6563. I think it is actually at 
a different wavelength because this is a redshifted object. Um, if I remember correctly, this line over here is, uh, let me see, let's go to the other window. This is the blue part. Yeah, okay. What dichroic are we using? Are we using the 50, D55 dichroic? Uh, 57, I think. Yeah, D57. Okay. That means in the red spectrum that we were looking at, sorry, this one that we were just looking at, where is it? Uh, the second one, second one. Second one is, one okay. Yeah. In this red spectrum, the top part of the spectrum, uh, are we seeing the full thing here? Yeah, so this top part of the spectrum is at 5,700 angstroms. And um, what is the bottom part of the spectrum? Do, you, do we know what the wavelength range is that's covered here? Um, I think we got down to about 8,600 when I was doing the calibrations. Okay, so what's the what's the halfway point between 57 and 86? Did not write it down. Hold on. 57 to 86. So that's 2900 angstrom. So at 1450, it's about 7,7150, the midpoint. Give me the wavelengths again. I'll just cap uh, calculate it real quick. 5700 on the 5700, D57 dichroic on the oh, upper end. From 5600 to 8500. 8,500, uh, 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 sorry, 5,600 to 8,500? Did, did you say 56? Yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't know exactly how far to the edge. No, that's close that. enough, yeah. that's close enough. Close enough for government work. Uh, so it says the central part should be 7,050, okay? Uh, I, uh, um, I was off. Now this thing, I, can, I think I can see this emission line here, even though it's quite, zoomed out let me see let's see if we can see it i think it's right there yep it's right there right in the center of the frame right right in the center so this thing is at about seven thousand angstrom so i think it's red it's a red shifted supernova it's a background supernova it's behind m31 this is not an andromeda target i assume no yeah so this is a background supernova i believe this looks like a classic h alpha sulfur 2 and 2 H, H alpha and two alpha two. In fact, here are the wavelengths. Uh, I'll put this in the chat. I'll put the wavelengths in the chat, the rest wavelengths. Hey Raja, I'll, um, I'll take leave. Um, okay, so okay, so we take This is fascinating care. and really appreciate this. It's certainly uh, very eye-opening in ways more than one and love to I'd love to connect separately, you know. In no problem. Sessions. And uh, just drop me an email if you want to be put on the Shadow of the Scientist mailing list. Happy yeah. to put, put you on there. Thanks, team. Thank you. Thanks, Moit. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. Take care, Sami. Um, so we're I'm looking at a supernova here. We're looking at, I believe this is a supernova. Rafael, you said the spectrum we were looking at was an old exposure of the standard, but not the one we're looking at now, right? This is the 1,000... Second exposure, right? This one? Yeah, this is the thousand second exposure. Yeah, this one. So, okay, I'm going to put these wavelengths here. Um, and I'm trying to, uh, so these are the three wavelengths in question of the three lines, N2, sulfur 2, sorry, N2, H alpha, and N2 again, two different N2 lines. I'll, I'll put the species names in the chart. It's N2, hydrogen alpha, and N2, and N means nitrogen in this case, right? Singly ionized nitrogen, that's why N2. Hydrogen alpha comes from hydrogen. Now, if I look at the gaps between these two wavelengths, so 6548 to 6563, that gap is what, 15 angstroms, right? Isn't 48 plus 15 equal to 63? Am I doing the math correctly? What is 48 plus 15? 63, yep. right? And then mm -hmm. 63 to, yeah. So the gaps between 
the left line and middle line is 15 angstroms and the gap between the middle line and the right is 21. Do you agree? 15 and 21 are the gaps between these first and second and second and third. And you can see that this is plausibly 15 and 21 in the sense that this is closer than this thing by a noticeable amount. Not quite a factor of two, but one and a half. This gap uh, is, uh, if, you, if you multiply it by one and a half, you get this gap. Because 15 multiplied by one and a half is 22.5, so a little less than one and a half. So I, I, that's, this is the pattern I recognize. And, and H alpha is always much stronger. This is the stronger of the N2 lines. This is the weaker of the N2 lines, even that we're seeing. So I, I don't know what the wavelength is of this thing, but I believe it's a background supernova. And you know, it just seems just eyeballing it. Seems like it's at a redshift of 0.1 or so. Let's look at the blue spectrum. We might see something interesting in it. Uh, I don't see any emission lines in it, but I don't see H beta, for example. That's the whole spectrum. No, I don't see any. Uh, the only, uh, I mean, the only thing that's this line over here, this very strong night sky line, is fifty-five seventy-seven. It's produced by oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere. You'll never guess where this line comes from. Never. This comes from city lights in San Jose. LEDs that use a blue they use a blue light to shine on a phosphor. This is the glow from the phosphor. Um, sadly, we are seeing human imprint in the night sky. Yeah. So this is, yeah, this line is 5577 on the far right. This very strong line that my cursor is over. Um, so what did I do here? Okay. But I don't see any emission lines in this spectrum here, the blue spectrum. Just because you know, it's too faint to see. But on the red side, we can clearly see what I believe to be. Okay, I'm willing to wager some money that this is a background supernova. Um, will this lead to an ATEL, you think? Will this, is that what the plan would be for these transients? I have no idea. I, I was understand. under the impression, like something. I haven't actually, <laughs> yeah, sorry, <laughs> I haven't actually looked at the observation list. I just trusted uh, Stefan and Stephanie to get that done. Uh, I thought maybe I, mean, I can check really quickly, but I, think I don't think it's just like. Have we observed this before? I think so. Yeah, I believe because Stephanie said she wasn't going to be here to reduce the standards tonight, that we were just going to re re um, observe all these transients that we had seen previously. Okay. Yeah. We observe a bunch of them, follow ups. Yeah, so this, is, this is supposed to be a variable. Um, I can check the, the, the what they're called. Because this clearly has emission lines. There's no question. Yeah, let's see. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm going to re relinquish remote control. How, how do I do that? Oh, sorry. I, I don't know either. Um, I, I'm going to stop remote control. There you go. It's all yours. Uh, oh, okay. Thank you. So uh, are you able to take a vertical cut through this um, oh. spectrum? Just the part that is, yeah, OK. Yeah, wow. this is so. This was a transient um, that we observed September fifth, I think. Okay. Did it not have the emission? That's lines interesting. Then? Um, September 5th I have no idea. Last, September fifth yeah. of last year, not not this year even. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, it's on our transient observation list from yeah a while ago. So it's pretty. That's pretty interesting that it it's still visible <laughs> and seems to be yeah. recurring, as you mentioned. That's that's pretty cool. Yeah, if you look at the light curve, it goes back pretty far, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it goes back four no, years, no, right? The light curve goes course. back four years. Yeah. But um, but it rebrightened about halfway in, into this yeah. graph, and then it sort of flattened. 
So when we observed it, um, what is the MJD today? Oh, in fact, it shows that this graph goes from 2019, March 28th on the far left, to 2023, January 1st on the far right. So where we are is the right edge of this graph. And so this goes all the way back to 2019. So it really goes back three and a half years. And it was very bright three and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. But now it's uh, it faded, then rebrightened. So it's interesting. I don't know what the it would be cool to compare it to the spectrum from a year ago. Yeah, um, looking at the spectrum, that I think we got that spectrum in 2021 around when it was rebrightening in that like big gap of uh, what's see. it called? I see. Yeah, because I zoomed in on it, and that range is about 2020. Uh, October until 2021, September. So, yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Question is, did it show those emission lines then? Yeah, that is a good question. Um, and looking at the light curve now, it does seem to be on an upward trend. So, where do you see that? Uh, if you just look at the very end of the light curve, that's the last reported data points. And you like, oh, yeah, yeah. In, okay. Okay. You can see it coming back up recently. It's coming back up. Yeah, I see that. But very mildly. Yeah, very, very small in comparison to its first few outbursts. I mean, the green shows an increase over the last, mm -hmm. what is it, 20 days? Eight, eight, six, zero, eight, eight, zero, last 20 days. It shows a sort of, yeah, the green shows a more dramatic increase than the red. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's what are the bang. small dots? Uh, upper and lower limits. So we kind oh, of ignore those. Where it wasn't measurable. Got you. This is all ZTF, right? Mm -hmm. okay. More ZTF is mm -hmm. something called the Zwicky Transient Factory, named after a famous astronomer named Zwicky. It's mm -hmm. a telescope at Caltech that is dedicated to looking for things that change. So mm -hmm. we, we take things that they find and we take their spectra. That's part of this project. Mm -hmm. There were gaps in um, over, over in coverage, yeah, because you know they yeah. didn't point to that part of the sky. Also, when something goes behind the sun for six months, you can't observe it. Okay, roughly six months. Mm -hmm. Is that a spectrum of the object? Yeah, um, from twenty nineteen, it looks like it was taken. Was it our spectrum or someone else's spectrum? Uh, Probably someone else's. else's. You can see the H alpha line. You can see the nitrogen two line. That's at six. Oh. Yeah, there you go. You can see the N2 lines as well. So according to this, okay, so this this thing at this dip at 6850, uh, that's, that's caused by the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, the big spike at 6563, that's it, hydrogen alpha. And I, if you, can you zoom in more into the spectrum? There's your nitrogen two lines. So H alpha, uh, yeah, if you zoom in more into, sorry, zoom in in time, uh, in wavelength, not, not in, in Y. How do, you, how do you get to the full uh, vertical range? <laughs> okay, maybe this. Um, yeah, even, even, even tighter in Y, uh, sorry, in X. Give it the full range in Y, but tight in X. Uh, what do you, you want me to zoom on it? Sorry. Uh, yeah, pick the yeah around uh, yeah. There we go. Yeah. So there's the sulfur two lines at sixty seven sixteen and sixty seven thirty one. There's two bumps in the far right. It's low low level bumps. Do you see them in the far right? Um, so, yeah, those two. Those two are sulfur two. Uh, there's you see 6584 is the nitrogen two line. This is the low bump here. And 6548 is sort of subsumed. Uh, you can see that sort of as a shoulder of that line. <coughs> you can't quite see it separately. Then H alpha is the main line at 6563. That little shoulder there, that's it. That's one of the nitrogen lines. So the H alpha line was broad in the past. And you can sort of see that actually, even in this spectrum, you can see in the spectrum we just took, like uh, if you if you show the um, the two D spectrum in the red, you can see that the H alpha line 
Um, yeah, you can't quite see it in this display, but. Uh, oh, uh, change the, you'll have to click and drag the, not that, but the, you'll have to click and drag the, the scale bar, the color bar on the far right. That one, yeah. It's wrapping around in a strange way. Yeah. Um, Wait, you want me to give you control again? <laughs> like no, it's fine. Is. What you're doing is fine. It's just that the, the you'd have to zoom out first because we can't see the star. Oh, we can't okay. see the line at yeah. all. Yeah. Oops, I missed. And then center. Is there a command to center, or you just kind of gotta? I think you'll have to just use that to center. I bought it. Whoop, that's the wrong way. Yeah, click further to the <laughs> left. Yeah, there, there you go. go. There you go. Yeah. yeah, click it. Yeah, just drag the color bar so that you've got black at one end and white at the other and no wrap black around. And right, like that. Yeah, like that. Oh, too much. For some reason, it is it's doing something different from what it did before. It does like the, not want it, it does not want to be perfect. Uh, let but. me just think about why it's doing that. Is this the second like, yeah. one thousand second exposure we're looking at? Uh, I believe so. Yeah. So between the first and the second, this thing. Uh, probably it got much brighter, and I think it's because we were looking at th through clouds the first time. Oh, yeah, the weather is hopefully clearing. Try, um, try histogram equalization in the you know where it says, yeah, in that one, H E Q in the lower, yeah, that one that helped a little, but still. Try log. Try square root. This saturation effect is still there. It's not going away. Hmm. Is it over saturated? It's not over saturated. No, it's not saturated. Yeah. It's just the color bar is wrapping around. There's a way to prevent that. I've forgotten how to do that now at this display. Yeah, good idea. The last option. What happens if you press clip? Not on there. No. But no, you might as well unclick it. I've forgotten. Uh, there's something that is causing that to wrap around, and there's a way to turn it off, and I've forgotten how. But let's let's zoom in. Yeah. What happens if you go to the spectrum and middle click on the emission line itself? I'll go up uh, more. You see where the emission line is, right? Uh, even higher, the main blob. Yeah. Oh, what happens yeah. if you middle click on that? Does it center it? No. I think so. Doesn't center. Okay. You can see it here. You can see it there. Yeah. Right. So. Anyway. Mysterious. This <laughs> this thing clearly had emission lines back in. 2021 when we when or whenever that other other people's spectrum you should when you come out maybe after something reduces it too it'd be easy to see what was that Stefan? it'd or, be easy to see after like stephanie uh reduces it yeah yeah you should be able to see it yeah right. okay and rafael the link you sent is the light curve link is it mm -hmm. okay yeah and um the Antares uh, link that I sent should have like a bunch of other stuff in there. And so that's where Stefan got the spectrum. You can that's go to you TNS. Gotcha. Um, and then that's a transient network. 
service. I don't know. I can't remember what it stands for, but um, transient name server. There we go. So TNS uh, is where people will post transients and stuff, and they'll upload some spectra. So this is the first classification report of it, and that's why Stefan has that really old spectrum. And let's let's uh, sorry if we go back to the object for a moment because um, and scroll up, please. Oh, on that that window. Yeah. What is S? Super luminous supernova is a type two. Uh, yeah, okay. So it's a supernova. And look, I guess redshift point one is redshift point oh nine. Uh, Not bad for an old man. <laughs> okay. This is restored some faith. That's what this is, supernova. <laughs> yeah, actually all yeah, over the place it says SN. If you look at the, next to the spectrum, it has SN 2019 MEH. That's how supernovae are named with letters. You know, it was discovered in 2019. Um, mm -hmm. And MEH, because now people go through the alphabet three times, there's so many supernovae discovered. You know, a little, if you scroll down just a little bit, uh, there you see SN 2019 MEH. That's what this object is. It was discovered in 2019 and it was supernova 2019 MEH. You can see the redshift of 0 0.0935. Mm. In fact, the spectrum was taken with the double spectrograph. In here, these two spectra, the blue and red, were taken on different dates. Um, 2019, September 22nd, 2019, July 11th. Do you see that? C snails and ZTF. So D DBSP, Palomar 200 inch, DBSP, DBSP is a double spectrograph. Um, P200 is a Palomar 200 inch. And ZTF um, observed this spectrum and ZTF, the ZTF team observed the spectrum. I don't know what the sea snails team is. I don't know what LT and Sprat are. Um, what would LT be? Uh, probably the name of some telescope, Bleuschner telescope. I don't know. But... Oh, hey, I have a friend who's uh, using Bleuschner in Berkeley, right? Bleuschner is at Berkeley, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, recently, I bet if you I did think... a Google search of LT and Sprat, it will tell you what that is. Liverpool. Liverpool Telescope, okay, in, in the UK. Sprat is spectrograph for the rapid ac acquisition of transients. There you go. So two different groups took a spectrum of this thing. But um, you can see the spectrum changed dramatically on the time scale of two months, right? Those are the dates, July 11th, uh, November, uh, September 22nd, changed dramatically. And what we're seeing now is the H alpha line is much narrower. So it was broad early, right? 20, uh, July 11th, it was really broad. And then it got narrower. And now we're seeing it as even narrower because we could see the N2 lines quite distinct from the um, H alpha line. And this is natural as a supernova um, ages, its expansion speed slows down. So the H alpha is no longer as wide. So we'll be able to put a third spectrum on top of this to show the evolution. Very cool. I bet this is worth an ATEL. We should ask Monica. Mohit, ATELs are these astronomical telegrams that a rapid <laughs> report tell the community we've got this, that we've got a spectrum of the are interested they can contact us well wow. it's, it's faster than a you know publication time scale it's so uh it's about it's about how um bright it is it was flatlining and then it's very bright again um there's so, that for the brightness but the spectrum has evolved also notice that in the beginning uh, the line was the red line was when it was discovered 
Mm -hmm. Then the blue line is later, two months later. And now here we are three years mm -hmm. later. Mm. And the, the, that main peak has gotten narrower. The two nitrogen, two lines are distinctly visible on each side of it. Mm. Um, so everything about the spectrum, the lines were very broad early on. And what, hap that's what happens when something is expanding rapidly, you have mm -hmm. Doppler shifted material, some moving away, some towards, so the lines are very broad. And so you can see that because of the broadening, you can see that the two sulfur two lines in the lower right they were not visible as two distinct bumps. They were looked at one broad bump. Mm. I also noticed that everything was shifted to the left. And, um, you know, there's generally, um, um, and I think that the reason for that is when this bubble is first expanding, it's also opaque, it's dense and opaque. And you preferentially see the part that's coming towards us. Mm -hmm. So it's of course blue shifted, it's shifted to the left. As the thing becomes more and more transparent, as it expands more, you can see the far side and the near side, it gets, uh, yeah. you know, it doesn't look preferentially moving towards us. So right. you can see these cool effects. Time. Yeah. How long can see. supernova last uh, typically? No, you well, know, if there's something called a typical supernova. There's, there, is, there are many kinds. Uh, yeah. So they, they typically, you know, it's not uncommon for them to last for weeks. Mm. But we wrote a paper recently on how supernova can rebrighten because the shockwave thing slams into its surrounding media. I think that's what we're seeing here. Because these things don't exist in isolation. They're mm. surrounded by material. And this is not in Andromeda. This is not in the Milky Way. It's in some galaxy that's uh, redshift mm. of 0.1. Oh. That means the universe is expanded by a factor of 1.1 .1 between light leaving the galaxy and us. So relatively little expansion, 10%. Hmm. So it was, uh, it was a background supernova. So the star that you were pointing at was kind of lost. No, it, we, it, it was, um, these things are not in Andromeda. We knew that from the beginning because they're not in the direction of Andromeda. Hmm. And these were just transients in the sky. So, okay. Um, if the, if we had pointed at Andromeda and found this was in the background of Andromeda, that can also happen. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not like the original source is lost, but what we thought, sometimes what we thought is a transient within the Andromeda galaxy turns out to be something in the background. In this case, it isn't even the direction of Andromeda. Mm -hmm. so, but it's further away than Andromeda, in that sense, background. Mm -hmm. So you're getting to witness a few hours in the life of <laughs> the work we do. <laughs> no, this is fascinating stuff with the, uh, the deduction process of how, you know, you take the input and then build the, not the story, but the facts. After yeah, analysis. yeah, interpretation of what yeah. we see. So. I'm going to call it a night because I have to write some letters of recommendation, Raphael, as you know. <laughs> Good luck with that. It's so much. <laughs> I'm going to, your input will be very helpful. I'm, I'm writing a total of seven, Raphael, so it's a fair bit of, fair bit of work between now and when I go to sleep. So, um, yeah, there's seven high school students who've asked for letters. Now the uh, the fact of the matter is, even though high school uh, the colleges are very particular about when they receive students' applications, mm. they don't care about when the letter of recommendation comes in, as long as it comes in within the next few weeks. Mm. I'm still going to try to get everything in, uh, not tonight, but by tomorrow night, which is the uh, early early deadline. Yeah, if there's one thing I've learned while in grad school: uh, getting things done early is way better than getting them done last minute. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so what are the other kinds of um, um, viewing that you do now this is the spectro we, you're we do a lot light. of spectroscopy more we do a lot of spectroscopy we occasionally do imaging just taking sometimes we do imaging in a mode called adaptive optics where we're correcting for the twinkling of the earth's atmosphere sometimes mm -hmm. we just take direct imaging most of the time our group takes spectra mm. so this one we're doing one object at a time but we are, when we're on KEC, we use an 
instrument that takes spectra of multiple objects at once, mm -hmm. multiple stars. Mm -hmm. Our group's bread and butter is sort of stellar spectroscopy. Got it. Okay, but, ready to move to the next target. I am going to send the new coordinates to Poco right now. Okay. So guys, I'll call it a night as well with Raja. I have a full day tomorrow. But okay, thank you so care. much. This was, um, um, I, I'm really, really appreciative of uh, hanging out with you. This was uh, very, very much a night I'll remember. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Take care. I'll talk soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.